So you're thinking, yeah. <laughs> I heard the Harry Enfield quote, and I thought, yeah, only me. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our pre-match press conference to preview our game against West Ham. We'll start <coughs> off with Vinny from Sky Sports. Uh, Sean, first of all, Seamus Coleman back in the Republic of Ireland squad. Is that useful in terms of him getting some game time, or is it a hindrance in terms of him still building up his fitness? It'd be useful, but unfortunately, he's got an injury, so we're not sure how serious that is at this stage. Um, Looks minor at the moment, but we'll have to wait and see. So, unfortunately, he just keeps getting there and he's been working very hard in training. So, yeah, that's an unfortunate one, but we've had a, a tough run at that, as, as you know. What is it he's done? Is it a recurrence? It's not minor hamstring, so we've just got to check that it's uh, nothing too serious or no over the weekend. Or so, well, probably no today, actually. Positive on the injury front is Brozier has obviously been training with the main group, in parts at least, anyway. Where exactly is he at and what's the plan for him now to as you build up? His introduction to first yeah, in parts is the right thing. He's he's just basically been a floater. That's it, just to get a feel of the ball and um, nothing other than that at this stage. Um, just out of trouble, you know, and just really get to know the players because obviously he, he came in injured, which everyone knew, and he's he's been working, you know, really really working really well actually, put a lot into his recovery with the sports science. So just getting around the players on the pitch, that is obviously is in the dressing areas and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, he's not bad any contact of any kind. It's just literally as a floater in certain parts of the training, um, just warm ups and stuff like that, and then working with the sports science team. So it's just a crossover now. Hopefully, from next week onwards, we'll start moving that forwards. I take it he will need behind closed doors friendlies as well. When are you thinking that? I take it he won't be able to do that during the international break. But no, of course. I mean, the timing's great that he's, he's getting there, but obviously with the international break, it's difficult because everyone disperses again. So, uh, But yeah, he's going to need a games programme, definitely. Do you know when that will be? Or? No, I mean, we, we're getting him to the point of training, so he's not there yet. From next week, we're hoping that he'll, he'll be looking more likely. As it happens, unfortunately, everyone disperses, as I said. As I said, sorry. Um, on the other hand, when he comes back in, he'll be, he will be in full training with the team. So the following week, when everyone comes back together, um, and therefore just take it on from there. You know, first things first, make sure he's fit and well, as in no more injuries. Obviously, Dominic Calvert Lewin has shouldered the majority of the workload up from this season. How helpful will it be to have that extra option for him to maybe lessen that workload when eventually Brozier is available? Yeah, I think with um, Beto's chomping, we've seen that. Um, Yusef has been extremely unlucky. Thought come back looking really fit and strong and playing hard in pre season. Um, AB's come in and, and got this period of, of being out, and then we're waiting for him to get fully fit. And, you know, I can only say on paper because you never know in reality, but you've got four strikers there who are all, all, I think, are very good strikers. Different reasons, young, older, that sort of thing. But a good experience, uh, sorry, a mix of experiences um, and a good four, but obviously two of them have been injured. How much of a difference do you think it would make having that forward line available when it comes to putting the ball in the back of the net, which obviously... Yeah, I mean, it's options. It's, 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 it's options. You know, all managers want options. Uh, we've been very limited this season, mainly because of injuries and, and the smaller squad. Um, been very unfortunate with that. But, yeah, it's many options and different ways of working, different ways of playing, you know, from different players affecting games in different ways. And we have been limited with that, certainly this season and somewhat last season and the season before. Because of the, the small squad numbers always put more pressure on the fitness side of things. Also fine margins, Sean, as well. You look back at that VAR decision from last week. I wonder, I know you're a fan of VAR, but at the same time, do you need to look at that offside decision and how marginal it was for better? Yeah, but the, the the thing I said afterwards, and I do believe in it, is I, I hear a lot of this debate about oh, I was only a toe offside, but a toe's a toe. When it, when where do you draw the line? You have to draw it somewhere. So I do believe that the offside thing is one of the best things about VR because for, I know there's been a mix-up, but virtually it's conclusive. Um, so I'm not really going to cry down on that. Other decisions, there is debates of when they should step in, they don't step in, and all the rest of it. But the, the, the offside, if you're offside, you're offside. You know, you have to find a line somewhere. So, you know, it's, where does it go? Is it how long is your toe? You know, you know size 10 is against the size 6. You know, you're going, well, you know, it's so it has to be. three minutes to decide. Yeah, that's the bit that no one understands at the minute. And I think we've been talking about that ever since VR came in. How can they speed it up? How can they um, be, uh, be more assured more quickly um, to get the right outcome? Um, so, yeah, of course, the, the speed element. Hence why, as you know, I don't like the, the referees going over to the screen. And they, I think it was, uh, I think there was only one turnaround on it and that was ours I think in a, in a season so you know what's the point if they've been told to hear what it's going to be then take that out of the equation and it speeds everything up um, but yeah In terms of getting players back this weekend Decore the only one? Yeah Decore's got a chance um, he's done very well to recover we're worried at first it'd be a number of weeks but he's, he's that settled down really quickly so he's got a chance uh, Obviously 
with the decision at centre half, you've, you've spoken about the form of Michael Keane and, and James Tarkowski being a, the factor in deciding that. At the same time, is there also an element of still having to manage Jared Branthwaite's return from injury? Um, yeah, I mean, he was out quite a long time. Um, he came back in, got re injured, so we didn't want that, of course. And in the, pro, in the bit in between, we'd won games. Um, you know, in my opinion, should have won the last one. You know, and we didn't, and then it all looks different. So if we win that, all of a sudden you three wins, three draws out of them six, and everyone looks at it differently. And that's just the nature of being at Everton Football Club and being the manager. Um, and then when you're talking about teams, we know he's a very good player, Jared, and we know that unit done very well last season. If you, you know, the back five, if you like, and there were some changes, but that, you know, that unit played together a lot. So we know all that. Um, of course, we want to address a, a, every end, a, every part of the pitch. Sorry. The key one is still scoring goals. You know, we created enough chances last week to score goals and gave away very, very little, really, in the way of good chance for the opposition. Is there also an element of sending out that message again, play well, you keep the shirt? Yeah, there's a bit of that. I mean, it's not literally, but yeah, I mean, I, I've always felt that, you know, when I was playing, I certainly, you know, held that in high regard. If I was playing well and doing the job, then I expected to get a chance to keep playing. Um, but yeah, it's not always about that. You know, Jared's a very good player. He knows that. Keno's done really well this season and is a very good player. As is Tarkin, Jake's doing great as well. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tight four there. And like I was saying about the centre forwards, if all four were fit, they all push each other and they all, you know, pushing each other for this year. And you want that internal competition as well as the external, which is playing the opposition, of course. Obviously, West Ham this weekend, how different to the side that you beat 1-0 down there last season? They obviously got three points at Goodison Park as well later in the season. Yeah, I mean, a new manager um, trying to instil, I'm sure, his, his thoughts on what he wants the team to do. Um, they've spent a lot of money over the last sort of two, three seasons. Um, so they've got some very good players. And, you know, it's like all managers, you're trying to find a formula and a way that it can work better. And I'm sure they're trying to do that. But they've, they've got some very good players. Um, a manager, I think, is a good manager. I, know, I don't know him that well, but I've, I've come across him a few times and speaks very well. Um, you know, he certainly did to me. You know, trying to form a side that can win, like we all are. Do you quite know what to expect? They've actually hit six in their last two at home, yet they've shipped a total of seven across games against Spurs and, and Forest. Yeah, and they're probably looking at us going, I think in the last, whatever it is, five or six, I think it's only us and Forest have only conceded three goals, or whatever it is. You know, they're probably looking, well, how does that work then? And then saying they haven't scored as many. You know, it's, it's these are the conundrums of, of the game, you know, and how, the, how teams operate. And, you know, taking a chance at one end, stopping them at the other. It's always the defining factor. But like I said, it's. Um, I think. I think we've we've been on a better forefront going to take these games on. I think we came away from that against Fulham, but I thought some of that was back on show against Southampton. Other areas of the game we could have done better in that game, but we certainly looked to force going forwards and creating chances, and to give away so little in defence and yet lose a game. Then that's that's really frustrating. But we've got to correct that this week, and that's what we look to do. Good luck. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Thanks for We'll go to Fraser. Um, just in terms of <coughs> strikers at the moment, you mentioned uh, the, po the options that you might possibly have at the moment. What's the thought process with Beto having come on quite a lot recently and, and done pretty well in terms of whether you decide who starts and who doesn't? Yeah, I mean, the, the team we're playing with for us, you know, what players are around them to, to help with the striking side of things. The team we're playing against, of course. Dom's record is, is pretty strong as regards his fitness now, and I think that was the biggest question mark. Some of his performances, he's still looking for real consistency, but we think he's a very good player. And Beto's learning all the time, and he, and he increases that by coming on the pitch. We know that. Uh, and I think he's been effective coming on the pitch. So the, the margins get tighter, quite obviously, because um, we want to win games, we want to score goals. Strikers are a big part of that. Um, what do you make of, of Beto as a character, given the fact that it's not all that many opportunities, certainly not in starting roles anyway, he's come off the bench a lot and had an effect. What's he like in terms of wanting to, to fight for his place? If you like? I think because of the, the analysis we've done on his game and the, the coaching and the coaching styles that we've used with showing him the analysis as well as working on the training ground, then I think he's actually quite receptive. I think he's in a place where he's like, yeah, I am learning. You know, he is developing in the, in the sense of the Premier League. It's a different, it's a different animal, you know, to what he's used to. So, I think he's been very accepting, uh, sorry, very accepting of that, and and trying to reproduce it on the training pitch. And there, in turn, when he gets a chance on the pitch, going and showing us what he can do. Thanks, Fraser. Uh, we'll go to Julian. Hey Sean, when you talk about that consistency then, you said there Dom needs a bit more consistency, but if Beto is coming on and, and showing that in the smaller window, does that mean then maybe he's the one that should be started? I, d I just wondered how you work that out with that consistency yeah, we, or how you get Dom that consistency. Yeah, we try and look at, um, you know, 
putting trust in people to deliver performances. Some of the stuff that fans don't always see. Obviously, with strikers, they, they are eventually, virtually always, um, looked at by their stats and their goal scoring, of course. And we'd be no different in that sense. But the management team look behind that and go, right, what's the effect on the game the strikers have? And strikers are the hardest position on the pitch, I think. I was a centre half, I think it's the hardest position. Um, so I suppose I'm, a, I'm slightly more tolerant of a striker, you know, when they're maybe having a quieter spell because I think it's a very, very tough role anyway. So I think there's a bit of that. Um, Beto's going along well, and I think he himself knows that he hasn't played as well as he can do in the past, but that's because he's learning. That's why we work with him. The coaches work with him, show him, and you know, try all the different ways for him to continue his learning. He's been he's been really, really um, accepting of that, and he's been working towards that to get him better and better. So the margins are getting tired though. I mean, he's coming on. He's affecting games. You know, Dom has had chances, hasn't scored. Consistency a bit up and down. So it's getting tired. How do you support a striker then if they're not getting those goals? And as you say, that's essentially what strikers are judged on. They'll say you've gone X amount of weeks without a goal. How do you support them to make sure they feel that they can still perform on the pitch? Making them aware of, of the stuff that they're doing other than scoring or creating. You know, the strikers can have a really good game without touching the ball that many times. Everyone knows that. You know, the runs they make, the, 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 the way they drag players around. That can be as effective as all sorts, you know, of, of different ways of playing, and certainly as a, as a technical performance. So reassuring the strikers that, look, that side of your game is good. Now you've got to keep getting into the key areas. You know, the, the stats and facts don't lie over many, many years in football. You have to get in certain areas of the box to score goals, and, and we keep reminding them of that. While we're talking stats then, I don't know if you've seen Opta have put out a league of who has statistically had the easiest start to the Premier League. Everton, it's claimed, have had statistically the easiest start. I just wondered how you assess that as Everton's manager. I assess it that stats are not always what you think. You know, I've been in long enough in the Premier League. You know, it's good spells, in different spells, tough spells, all the rest of it from different, you know, fixture lists and when you see it. Um, so that's the way it goes. You know, did we want to start back then? We had done, yes. The last run of games, barring the South Island, if we win that, you know, three wins, three draws out of six, and all of a sudden the story is going where we wanted it to go because it's a lot more positive and a lot more reality bound on what we expect from ourselves. So, you know, these are the fine margins, you know, and, and we've got to make sure that they come in our favour. I just wonder as well, I, I think some fans would have liked to have seen Jared come back into the starting lineup. Can you explain how, is it a collective where you work out how a player comes back from injury, for example? Some seem to come back quicker than others. I know Nathan Patterson's still waiting and some maybe get a knock and then are back in the side. I just wondered, how is that? Is that a collective? Do you speak to the medical team or is it about the, the personality of that player in particular? No, it's generally the, the shared information from the medical team, sports science team, the coaching staff and, of course, the player. You know, and some players have had, you know, you can't explain every single detail about every single injury, but some injuries are a lot more delicate than others. You know, they have to be really careful and if that, if that approach goes too far... You know, in a split second, you can affect someone for three weeks, four weeks. And unfortunately, we've had a few of them where they've been coming back from semi-serious injuries, not, not career-threatening, but semi-serious, like Jared's one was. Starts a very simple situation, a minor operation, then it leads to a secondary phase of that injury, then it leads to a third phase of that injury, then it gets fit and then it gets re-injured. So that's the Jared story. It's not, there's no, no lack of thirst to get these players fit, I can assure you, because that's what helps us. Does, so, does his age come into play? You've got to get them fit enough to actually play. You know, if you put them out there when they're too early, I thought it was a bit early for Jared, but the consensus was, no, I think he's right to go and play. And then two days later, he got injured again. So I'm, I'm not saying I'm right, but I just thought it was a bit too quick. So we had to be careful, get him back again, because if not, you go through that period where it's play a few, get injured, play a few, get injured. And we're trying to push that away because we've had so many injuries. Yeah, is it because as well he's quite young, isn't he? Still, uh, you, you, we see him as a senior player, maybe, but actually his age comes into play. He's had one season in the Premier League, you know, which is. Don't get me wrong, we're very good, a very, very good season in the Premier League, but still only one season in the Premier League. He's got a lot of learning to go, a lot of development to go, in my my opinion. Um, and fitness is a big part of that to physically be out there developing, of course. Thanks, Julia. We'll go to Will. Uh, Sean, just check on Indai. Is he all right after coming off at Southampton? Yeah, he was out there today um, in Van Duke, so we're, we're hopeful on that. I mean, we'll, we'll await the... Um, Tomorrow morning, in case there's any stiffness or anything like that, but we're hopeful on them too. He's primarily plays and die on the left wing. Um, is there a chance that maybe he could play in that number ten role? Or would you see him in there? There is, if we think he's got a chance to deliver. Um, you know, it, I think 
with, we've had patches of seeing him in there and I think the, the the key thing about learning that role as you've seen with Dwight Dwight's been effective on the attacking side and the defending side is more difficult you know that's that, that role in the Premier League has changed you know 10 or 15 years ago the number 10 you almost sort of let them do what they wanted to do but you can't anymore you know the, the way the game's changed the number 10s now they defend from that position you know they work really hard from that position so it's about the developing the players to play that position and uh, he'd never played it in the Premier League don't forget and I think he has looked sharp coming from the wide so I think there's a, a balance to what you see and what your gut tells you as well and what your staff tell you and the opinion of the staff big positive that a lot of people took from Southampton's performance of Otto Mangala. Have you rated his development since he arrived at the club? Yeah, I mean, I think I think he's another one getting that true true level of Premier League fitness and certainly what I expect out of Premier League fitness. And I think he's getting there. He's good around the group. He's got a good character about him. He's got a little bit more experience than some of the other players. And he's he's going along well, I think. Just in terms of Dominic Calvert-Lewin, do you think that you've managed to give him the right service in terms of goal scoring chances and thinking back to that season where he scores all those goals? Yeah, I mean, it's one of them, there's always a debate on that, but if you look last season, he had the highest XG in the league for missed chances, so if you're missing them, you're there to get them, so that's the key, you know, are you there to get them? So if you're there to get them and you're getting lots of them, then that's really what you want out of your team and out of the strikers, because sometimes they make their own chance, of course, so... I think there's a sign of it, and I, and I think different styles. We we try and mix it up, as everyone knows. We do play longer at times, no problem with that. We play short when we need to, but with his skill set, um, I think I mentioned it before. You know, before I was even there, I remember speaking personally, and I saw an interview recently about with Ancelotti saying, "Got a keeper who can kick it down the pitch. I've got a big centre forward who wants it playing up to him." So he said, "I got him to kick it to him." It's Carlo Ancelotti. So. His interview, his words, not mine, before people start trying to make out that I'm trying to put myself in his world, I'm not. But that was his interview, and he said that to me personally. So I think you've got to remember the skill set of the players. You know, and I've always tried to look at the group I've got and go, right, what can make that group effective and what can make it win? And then the second part of that is if we can do it in a style that everyone likes, which is very, very difficult in the Premier League for any manager to mix that all together and, while we're doing it, cutting numbers and developing players and selling them and getting up the league, trust me. The task in itself. Just finally for me, at times during your tenure it's been quite streaky, you went on long unbeaten runs and then you haven't won for a period of the time. What do you put that down to and how do you remedy that, especially with the fixtures coming up? In yeah, December? it's it's tough. I mean, injuries haven't helped this term, but I agree it's been ups and downs and periods of really strong, periods of not so strong. And I mean, usually if you look under the stats, it's been injuries to what you'd consider very important players and very important times, um, along with but basically, the cutting edge at both ends. I've spoken about endlessly. Every manager does. You know, we've we've created so many chances in games and not taken them, conceded like we did last week uh, from a nothing situation or should have been a nothing situation. After creating enough chances, to score the goal, uh, score the goals capable. I think uh, we've doubled their xG, double their chances, all the rest of it. You know, they're, they're the defining factors of, of what decide a run and the consistency of doing that. You know, scoring regularly, not conceding regularly, is a good mixture, obviously. And we haven't found that true consistency. Thanks, Will. Any further questions in the open section before we move on? No? Okay, thanks. Cheers, John. Cheers.